Good evening. I'm Alan Holman. I'm the curator at the Hampton History Museum. Welcome to our Port Hampton Lecture Series. Uh, tonight we have a special guest, Nancy Shepard, who's going to talk to us about her new book, Abandoned Tidewater. And I'm not going to get into its because I want her to speak all about it. I do want to uh, tell you about some other upcoming events we have uh, soon. Uh, this Wednesday night, same format, same place, uh, you'll be seeing us uh, our virtual front porch series, Gay Abagdala, uh, Songs from the Griot, uh, traditional blues to tell contemporary stories. It'll be a Facebook Live just like this, and that is Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, two days hence, uh, from 7 until 8. Uh, it's a member of a class of traveling poets, musicians, and storytellers who maintain a tradition of oral history in parts of West Africa. Gay sees herself as a present-day griot who manages black history using the blues as her art form for storytelling. So please join us again two days from now for a similar uh, experience. This weekend, we have our Bayshore Beach experience. Uh, hopefully you've seen us before. Uh, annually we host this and we celebrate uh, our heritage at Bayshore, which was the, uh, the African-American beach counterpart of Buck Row. And uh, we're going to have up some exhibits uh, for you to see, some things like that, some photos you can see live. So if you come in on Friday or Saturday uh, during the day, during our regular business hours, you'll see uh, those exhibits. But we're doing another Facebook Live event Saturday night on the 19th from 6 until 8 p.m. And Reginald Robinson and Judy Leonard, who have always pulled together these, uh, this wonderful event, and we've only been the host, We'll be here, and uh, they were going to give you a good experience of what uh, the Bayshore uh, beach experience was uh, in its heyday. So let me tell you a little bit about Nancy. Uh, she's an award-nominated nonfiction author, historian, and public speaker, and photojournalist. And uh, she has several publications that we have actually hosted her to speak to us about before, about the airship Roma disaster in Hampton Roads, uh, Hampton Roads Murder and Mayhem, which is a lot of fun, but I like the Roma disaster bit. I'm seeing a pattern here, Nancy, that's disaster. Mm -hmm. um, and tonight's book, Abandoned Tidewater. There's so many things around here in this area rich with uh, history and heritage that kind of slide from public view, and Nancy has dug them out and written a wonderful uh, synopsis of that, wonderful photos. I'm going to turn you over to Nancy. She's going to tell us all about it. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. It is always a pleasure to be here at Hampton History Museum, especially during these times where we have to take an unusual format in order to come together. Like Alan said, I am Nancy E. Shepard. I'm nonfiction author. Um, I'm also a historian, and I kind of fancy myself a little bit of a photographer. So tonight, we're going to talk about Abandoned Tidewater, Forgotten Relics of Southeastern Virginia. This is my brand new book, and it's a little bit different from the other ones if you're familiar with the rest of my work. Um, there are images that are completely original to kind of take you into these places around the Tidewater area that are no longer in use but are still standing. So what does it mean when we say that something is abandoned? This is a place that or places that are frozen in time for whatever reason, and it was left behind. Uh, we are talking about places that once had some sort of significance and are no longer in their use. And we have these scattered all over the Hampton Roads area, and tonight we're going to particularly look at several, uh, four different locations, uh, three of which are on the peninsula, one of which is on the south side. It's a little harder to find these places on the south side um, as places like Virginia Beach are notorious for knocking things down. Um, now to reach these places, many of us have to do what's called urban exploring. This means that we venture off on paths with our cameras and we climb through all sorts of other otherwise dangerous situations to catch a glimpse of these post-apocalyptic looking places. Um, that were left relatively untouched by people since they were abandoned. Now, this is a moment to examine the before and after of a location. As historians, we have a responsibility to the artifacts, the stories, and to the truth, even if those truths are a little hard to swallow. 
Tonight, we're not just going to take a light-hearted romp through the woods together, but we're going to dig deeper and into some of these important lenses that are very, well, for lack of a better word, important to talk about, especially in today's socio-political climate. Um, after all, history is cyclical in nature, and if we don't recognize that and acknowledge the antecedents behind events, then we are destined to repeat them. This is important to have an open discussion about and to keep our minds open about the nature of human existence and history. But first, I have to add a word of caution. As I just discussed a moment ago, urban exploration can be quite a dangerous and sometimes illegal pursuit. So I am not advocating doing this through this presentation. Uh, so don't venture to these places without proper permission uh, from the owners of the properties. And also understand that you are doing it all at your own risk. You'll come into pitfalls, you'll have vines, vegetation, animals, vermin, and many other things to encounter. So you need to understand that these hazardous and unsafe situations you explore, again, entirely at your own risk. And a little rule of the road for those of us who go kind of urban exploring, you leave only footprints where you go and you take nothing with you but memories and photos. So I think it's time for us to dive in. And we're going to talk first about Camp Patrick Henry and I know there are probably several people who kind of remember what this is, know a little bit about it, so let's see what it was. There is no doubt that the military plays a significant role in our culture here in the Tidewater area. Um, many of us, I was born in 1983, so many of us think that the military and the big bases are here, that are here are almost like ancient relics of our entire history. But there were a lot more posts and camps here throughout throughout time, and this is one of those. Um, Camp Patrick Henry was located in Newport News, uh, near Jefferson Avenue, in kind of the Denby area by what is now the uh, airport. And in the quiet thicket of trees near Denby Boulevard is what's left of this once thriving, though short-lived base, and it's being swallowed by the marsh it sits atop. Now, Camp Patrick Henry was founded in 1942, and it was supposed to be a staging point to send soldiers, Red Cross relief workers, over to Europe and to Africa during World War II. But it was more than just a staging area. Camp Patrick Henry was also a prisoner of war camp, for instance. And at one point, it held a capacity of 600 POWs that were brought over from the other side of the Atlantic. The post had a variety of amenities. Um, here are some Red Cross workers on their way to go serve in the war. Uh, but these amenities included a movie theater, commissary, churches, post offices, a direct rail line so soldiers can leave the base and go out into town, a uh, telephone center that we saw in the previous picture, water, sewage, mess halls, and even a general store. And it would be like the 1940s version of what we think of today as the PX or AFES. Um, there could be upwards of 3,000 soldiers stationed there at any given time. When the war came to an end in 1945, the post was deemed unnecessary and it was quietly closed down. Much of the land was sold off, but a small parcel remained and was repurposed by the Army into a small site for Nike Missile Command N85. Now this isn't actually um, N85, but this, is, this comes from our neighbors down in Carrollton. Um, this was one of 291 batteries located throughout the United States and by the, by the 1960s. For the Cold War, it was necessary to have these in very strategic locations. Uh, the Tidewater itself boasted several of these Nike missile sites, whether there's the one in Carrollton, there's another one in the Kempsville section of Virginia Beach where I grew up, and several others throughout the area. The site in Newport News even had a small military housing complex that still remained up through the late 1980s. Now, Nike Missile uh, Command 
N-85 originally housed the Ajax missile, and then in 1958, they housed the Hercules missile, and that was the last missile that was there. In 1971, uh, the Nike Missile Command was shut down, and the housing units again remained and through the 1980s, and then they were eventually to torn down and the land sold. So the question is, what remains of this mysterious place? The afterlife of Camp Patrick Henry has been silent and nearly frozen in many ways. Most of the buildings associated with the post itself are long gone, uh, but there are still a few relics remain, whether it is uh, a small concrete building or different fire hydrants on what were the main roads. Um, these pieces of buildings, also random appliances, I believe there's a toilet bowl we spotted, just litter through the woods and bricks are scattered throughout this brackish water encrusted tomb of what was the base. And then perhaps the most bewildering sight of all are, is the Nike Missile Command. Uh, you have these large orange and white radar towers that reach the top of these tall trees just next to the runway at the airport. Um, there is broken refuse and concrete buildings that are crumbling. And this has also become a hidden secret respite place for the local homeless population, as well as those of us who are planned destined urban explorers. Now, I don't advise going to this because number one, it's not very legal to go to, and number two, it is very dangerous to maneuver. Ceilings are collapsing on these buildings, wires are frayed, and it's unknown whether or not they may still be active. Uh, there are rusted out fuse boxes, and there's no telling how one person could hurt themselves while attempting to traverse these grounds. But there is a sort of beauty in this otherwise science fiction looking um, area. The vibrant colors that tag the buildings from graffiti artists, uh, the inventive ways the grounds have been repurposed by the homeless population with like the radar towers being turned into homes. And a quiet hush of the base's past life remain in the stillness of the moment while you're there. Um, okay, and next we're gonna talk about the Rosewell Plantation. If you're not familiar with where Rosewell is, it's really kind of off the beaten path up on the other side of the York River in Gloucester. Uh, it can be interesting to drive to. I, I drive a Prius, so driving a Prius on these back dirt roads are exciting. Um, but the ruins of this place indicate the opulence uh, that existed for the extreme halves in the 18th century of the Virginia colonial climate. But its afterlife has given a platform to tell some of the stories that are often overlooked in this type of environment where we focus on the plantation owners or the founding fathers who were the people that actually worked the grounds and created what became the wealth for the owners. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight. To give you an idea of Rosewell. Construction began on it in 1725 when wealthy landowner Man Page I decided he wanted a home of his own. And this was not only one to rival some of the estates back in England, but also the governor's mansion in Williamsburg. Uh, the money that Man Page I brought to Rosewell was not only through his own little pursuits and whatnot, but also through inheritance. He was a descendant of Colonel John Page who worked as an agent in the Royal Africa, African Company and as a broker in the slave trade. So it was wealth inherited from business of holding and selling other human beings and human bondage. The Page family was not only wealthy but influential. Page's son, Man Page II, rubbed elbows and hobnobbed with likes of influencers like Thomas Jefferson. When Man Page I died before the plantation's completion, his son took over the estate's building and its completion in, 19, in 1738, excuse me. The house itself was the epitome of Georgian architecture. 
and it sprawled over 12,000 square feet with three stories and four massive chimneys sticking out from its roof. It had large sweeping rooms and a full English basement that you could stand up in, and so it was practically a four-story building, which is quite enormous for that time period. It was inspired by the architecture work of Christopher Wren, and it had two large cupolas on the roof, which you can see in this drawing. There were large windows with ornate keystones, and it was built with Flemish bond brick construction. The interior of the home was just as impressive as this exterior, with mahogany and marble tile and surrounds for the fireplace. And it was, it was placed along with the fine furnishings inherited through the family. And like many of Page's uh, contemporaries, Man Page II dabbled in agrarian trades, po prospering from tobacco and grain crops. Also, like many of his contemporaries, Page relied on the manual labor of the plantation, and as you might have guessed, namely, slaves. There could be as many as 76 slaves working the property at any given time. And while their master drank and partied, I guess you could say, with the frills of society, these slaves were forced to live in the bonds of chattel slavery, pouring their blood, sweat, and tears into the grounds the pages reaped the rewards from. Rosewell remained in the Page family for three generations, including being the home of John Page, who served as Virginia governor from 1802 to 1804. Still, the history of slavery permeated the grounds. It was a system of slavery that many elite Virginias uh, replicated their own opinions from the, those of Thomas Jefferson, stating they hoped the institution would eventually fade away, but they were unwilling to confront it nor disband it for themselves. It was, I guess you could say, greed overlapping the dignity and, of people, and Rosewell, the Rosewell mansion reeked of the opulence that made um, and continued to be on the backs of those that were enslaved there. However, the tobacco trade began dwindling, and the family found themselves also unable to keep up the appearances. In 1836, the home, was, the home and its property were sold to a New York businessman, Thomas Booth. The original roof was, ch was changed out from, to be a more appropriate mid-19th century architecture. The prop property continued to change hands and was, was never as prosperous as the pages knew it to be. Now, during the Civil War, it was a place that the Union Army raided, um, and in the aftermath of the war, the home fell into disrepair. This picture is from the post-war period. Many of the fine additions, like the hand-carved marble, fireplace surroundings, and the mahogany were sold off, and the structures stood still. The local African-American community, many of whom were descended from the plantation's former slaves, saw this house as an icon for the hell that they and their ancestors were forced to endure, and the long road they had ahead of them towards equality. On March 24, 1916, 1916 sorry, fire swept through the house and burned for several days. One local African-American farmer was asked if he would help douse the flames, and all he could utter was, let it burn. The house was left a shell. And then in 1943, the entire Tidewater Peninsula was rocked when bombs loaded with torpex accidentally went off in the dead of night at the Yorktown Mine Depot, which is now today the Yorktown Naval Weapons Station. It shook the peninsula, and it sent much of Rosewell's remaining fragile frame to the ground. And there it sat since. Now, Rosewell has been given a promising afterlife, unlike several of the places that we are going to examine. There is now a visitor center on the property where you can learn from the docents the vibrant history of the property, see artifacts, and really become embedded in the full spectrum of the life that existed there. And there continues to be archaeology that's performed. Uh, visitors are advised once they get onto the property not to go anywhere near what is left of Rosewell. As you can see in this picture, there's not much left there and it is crumbling. 
and it can be very hazardous. Um, now, little remains of the lavishes, uh, lavishness that the pages had envi envisioned. The chimneys continued to reach endlessly into the sky, and some of the Ren-inspired keystones um, are still there on the glassless windows, which you can see in this picture. Like many of the abandoned places we're going to talk about, it's very, very quiet there. There are black walnuts that litter the ground, the sounds of crickets and birds against the morning dew and the breeze off the river. The stillness of this place would be enchanting if it weren't for the reality of all that happened there. And at a nearby church, the Page family is buried in these elaborate above-ground tombs. But back at the, their homestead, an untold number of those that were enslaved at the property remain underground in unmarked graves. The next thing we're going to talk about is one that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is the hydrogen processing plant at Langley Air Force Base. If you know anything about my work, uh, I have spent the past decade dedicated to telling the stories and preserving the memory of the forgotten tragedy of the U.S. Army dirigible Roma that Alan mentioned earlier. This is a tale that is something that we would normally put on to monuments and name streets after, but it's one that's been largely forgotten in the near century since the disaster happened. So there isn't much left to draw us back to the Roma period. But in a quiet corner on Langley Air Force Base, at what is referred to as the LTA, or lighter than air section, sits the ruins of this large brick building which once provided hydrogen to fill the largest American airship of its time. And it was the catalyst that killed so many in the deadliest disaster of the U.S. hydrogen airship. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Roma. Roma was acquired from Italy in 1921. She was an odd ship, as you can see from the picture. And she was of the semi-rigid variety, and that's something in between the large zeppelins we think of and the small blimps. She was the largest airship the American fleet had, and the Army was determined to show that they knew how to use a large ship because the Navy was tasked with building a large ship of their own. However, Roma was riddled with problems, and there was a debate that raged in political opinion and in government whether or not they should use the highly flammable gas, hydrogen. And all of this remained in this quagmire of government bureaucracy, but nonetheless, Roma had to fly. On a cold, damp afternoon, on February 21st, 1922, 45 officers, crewmen, and civilians boarded Roma for a test flight with her new engines. Just a short time later, only 11 of those 45 sur would survive when it crashed to the grounds of the Army Quartermaster Depot in Norfolk. One of the survivors would die many years later from the long-term injuries he sustained rescuing his shipmates that day. It was a tragedy and remains a tragedy that has been forgotten over time with heroes that were undeniable but never properly honored. It is a gutting story of loss and sacrifice in the line of duty. And these men were important, not just to their time, but to all time, and yet their memory has never been given the honor they deserve. So how does this draw us into this hydrogen processing plant for the purpose of speaking about abandonment? You see, in the early 20th century, controlled flight, which is like planes with engines and whatnot, was still an incredibly new concept. Planes could only carry a light payload, and they were fragile and often impractical. So airships were deemed to be the counterparts that could compensate for everything the planes couldn't do, including carrying a great deal of people or munitions, remaining aloft for a great deal of time for recon purposes, and for other advantages for long-term distance flight. The lifting gas of choice was hydrogen. This was an extremely light gas. It was cheap to produce and to store. 
As such, hydrogen processing plants were built at bases where airships would be, including Langley Field. And the previous picture and this picture are of the hydrogen processing plant at about that time period. Now, in 1921, the efficacy and long-term fiscal advantages of helium had been proven, yet the War Department opted to still use hydrogen. And while preparing for the last flight in 1922, this building was probably one of the last places that the men of Roma came to. There was a loud clutter of machines and the rush of getting casks of hydrogen out to the hangar to fill the airship with. And these were probably some of the last things that these men heard before leaving the ground for the last time. After the Roma disaster, debate raged about the use of hydrogen. It was determined that no other American airship would ever fly with hydrogen again. The plant was abandoned and from its original purpose. However, as air technology continued to evolve and the fragility of, an air, of airships continued to be proven, the airship program dwindled to a hush into silence. Attempts were made with this structure to repurpose it for other things, whether it be offices, but nothing of any sort of permanent use, and eventually it was abandoned. Today, the building remains a broken hulk of a time long since past. Long gone are the many machines and the pictures you saw previously that crisscross the interior and they were replaced by broken makeshift walls, asbestos crumbling out of various corners, animal feces, and just emptiness. It has sat languishing in the ethers of historical limbo, frozen in time in a wave, but also being claimed by the mold, vermin, and forces of nature that have surrounded it. Still, standing in the middle of the building, I thought of the faces of those men. I thought of their names and how they gave their lives so long ago. How their spirits still echo loudly in the barren hulk of this plant and it remains a relic of a forgotten time and of a neglected tragedy. Next, we're gonna kinda of get into what I guess the kids call the heavy conversation, and that is the Porter House. Now, this next subject is one that I must preface, will be filled with my own lens of a subject based on my own academic and professional research and work as a historian. I understand that many will stand in contrast, maybe even take a little offense to what I may say or and what I have written in the book. And this is a controversial topic, incredibly relevant to today's political landscape. And these are conversations that we must have. In other words, I am talking, I'm asking for open minds when it comes to these discussions and we are going to talk about now the 1831 rebellion led by Southampton County slave Nat Turner. Through this, we are going to use the visuals of the Porter House, which was once belonged to one of the families that was involved in this. This is a time to talk about not just what Nat Turner did, but the aftermath and the way the man was, has been unfairly vilified throughout time. This is a story that still resonates and speaks volumes as to what the African American community continues to endure to this day. Now, I'm not so arrogant as to claim I could ever understand the experience of being African American in the United States. But it's time that we start looking at history for what it was and expand our conversations and understanding to truth in order to fairly teach history and become better as people. You see, Nat Turner was a deeply religious, charismatic, and incredibly intelligent man, yet he was held in the cruel institution of chattel slavery. In the selling of property, his master sold his wife, Nat Turner's wife and child, to another farm, breaking up his family. He was forced to witness cruelty inflicted upon his fellow slaves and lived with the knowledge that he was considered less than a person. 
he had a vision one night in which he believed that God meant him to be the Moses of his people, liberating them from this unfathomable fate. He gathered with a group of insurgents and collectively they killed 55 white men, women, and children. And this is a horrifying thing to think about. The Porter family, whose house that we're talking about tonight, managed to evade the insurgents when they were warned by a loyal slave of theirs. In the aftermath, militias converged on the Southampton County, killing not only those who participated in the uprising, but also anyone who remotely looked like them, freed or enslaved, innocent or guilty. There is an unknown number of African Americans who were killed in this counterinsurgency, I guess you could say, but it could be well into the hundreds compared to the 55 that were killed by the uprising. Even worse, their bodies were given a less than dignified ending with skin stripped from their, their bones and their bodies decapitated. Their heads were placed on pikes and in this macabre spectacle along a major thoroughfare. When Nat Turner was eventually captured, his trial was a folly. He was executed, and like many of those in the months before, his body was stripped of skin for disgusting trinkets and his head removed. This is all that is left of Nat Turner today, a portion of his skull. Now, Nat Turner's history is a complex one, and we have to ask, was he a villain or was he a martyr for his cause? And what came to pass after the uprising were stricter laws prohibiting African Americans from gathering, receiving any sort of an education, and other measures to further dehumanize them. The Porter House stands as one of the last pieces of this complex history, and the walls have fallen to the ground with weeds holding the rest together. The road where the heads of the African Americans who were murdered following the insurgency are, it, the road is now called Blackhead Signpost Road, which was renamed because it originally included the slanderous N-word. And the history of the Grand Old South is still something that we are debating today. But what it comes down to is examining what the entire insurgency, civil war, and aftermath is regarding slavery. Many will claim that it was about states' rights, and while evading, question, evading questions about where slavery played a role in this. And yes, it was states' rights. It was the right to hold those living, it's right, right for those living in those states to hold other human beings against their will, to treat them worse than farm animals, and to dehumanize persons beyond belief. And I know that there's going to be a lot of argument on that. But this legacy that we are fighting for today, a legacy of inequality to a community that deserves so much better, um, no one should ever have to fight for their right to be treated like a human being. And if you think that there isn't injustice today, I implore you to put down your phones and social media after this web series and ask to listen to the stories of your African-American neighbors and then ask how you can help. Now that was a lot of heavy. So I always prefer liking to draw these to a close with something more lighthearted and something we all are curious about in this area, and that is President's Park. Now, it was a tourist attraction that existed for a very finite amount of time, and it was what you would think of with these roadside attractions. It was tacky, it was an amusement, and it was, had a really great homegrown feel. But perhaps its afterlife has had more colorful of a history than the park itself. Having garnered once a tourist trap feel, I guess you could say it's kind of evolved into the same thing today in its afterlife. So what was 
President's Park. Well, it was the little park that couldn't. It was the dream of Everett Haley Newman, and it was open in 2004 in Williamsburg, around where Water Country USA is in York County. It had these 15 to 20 foot busts of every president through George W. Bush, and they were brilliantly made by a Texas sculptor. They looked very lifelike with intricate details. And then inside this red brick building on the property that almost looked like a red brick version of the White House, they had several different things in there. They had a replica White House, or Oval Office, excuse me, uh, set, which even Saturday Night Live used. Uh, they had mock-ups of the First Lady gowns, and they had the contents of the defunct Maryland-based Presidential Pet Museum. Now, the park itself was controversial because through the York County government and local members of the community, because they weren't entirely embracing of it, claiming it was tacky. But it wasn't just the community that added to these troubles. And there was a lot of fledgling problems with this museum being able to survive. The admission was considered high for what visitors felt like they got from it. And the location was not visible behind a hotel and not from the highway, and it was far away from anything that a lot of tourists would come to the area to go to, whether it's Colonial Williamsburg or Bush Gardens. So the vast majority of this tourist traffic stayed away from there. On top of that, there was a high cost to maintain these busts. They were on a steel structure with a concrete frame, and of course they were fragile, and in the different climatic changes of this area, they had to keep patching them. So in 2010, the cost was way too great to keep it open, and Newman could not sell the property. In 2010, the door shut on President's Park for, for, the, for good, and it sat derelict for many years. When the property was finally purchased, a local contractor, Howard Hankins, couldn't bring himself to destroy these beautiful busts because they are great works of art. So instead, he opted to spend $50,000 and carefully move each one to his private property in Croker. Now, as each bust was moved, it was a bit of a beast as these things were very large and very heavy and you couldn't take them apart. En route, Abraham Lincoln's effigy rolled off the flatbed tr truck, and in a rather gruesome twist of historical irony, the back of the left side of his head was destroyed. And of course, those of us who are historians have a bit of gallows humor regarding this. The, the, in the interim, Hankins has mused with several ideas as to what to do with this collection of heads. Uh, he mused about opening a presidential-themed water park near King's Dominion and Doswell, or even selling the heads to the Reeds Across America Foundation in Maine. However, none has yet come to fruition. The property where the heads are located is completely inaccessible to the public. Um, you have to receive formal permission and is heavily monitored. However, Hankins has partnered with Virginia photographer John Plaschel, and, they, and he gives guided tours of these heads in this pit um, with a wealth of presidential and park knowledge and history. And you can purchase tickets on John Plaschel's Facebook page. And I've gone twice. I encourage you to do so. It is well worth it. Now, as for the heads themselves, they continue to sit in slow disrepair with animals and a variety of plant life weaving themselves through the steel structure. And my daughter always likes to point out the fact that she saw a beehive up one of the president's noses. And each bust, it further emphasizes the point that someday everything will return to nature in a way. And it's become this kind of romantic odd sight. And I can tell you going there, when you go down the hill and then you see the, the heads of all these luminaries of American history, it is rather like being in the Planet of the Apes movie, I have to say. 
So I know this has been a little shorter than my normal presentations, but I have some closing thoughts. See, everything in life is temporary and time is fleeting. Each place encases memories of stories and perhaps many of those remain untold. Hidden in the crumbling walls, broken lights, collapsing ceilings, and the rotten decay encrusting its surface. And beneath it is still the vestige of what was once there and the lives that passed through those hallowed halls and places. When looking at the abandoned, it is more than just a voyeuristic adventure into the past, but also a questioning of what stories these places would tell if it were possible. It is about preserving memory, telling the stories, and the responsibility we keep to our posterity to keep these voices alive. In the abandoned, there is still life. And thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you very much. What a wonderful presentation. Uh, I had my mask on. You'll see that uh, we're doing our best. The book is available in our gift store. And uh, please feel free. We're open to the public now. You can come by and get a copy. Some, is there somewhere else that's available, Nancy? Uh, on my website. Oh, you can go to Nancy's website. But I and encourage you to come out here. <laughs> please come to the museum and see the museum while you're here. Uh, we have some time to take some questions, if you would like, and I'm going to turn that over to Seamus McGran, who has been monitoring. Uh, if you have questions, type them in on Facebook, and, uh, and Seamus will ask them to Nancy and get you an answer. Thank you. I also have a small audience here of my husband and children, if they have any questions as well. Ah, my daughter, Emery, is now asking a question. Roswell. It, it's true. Um, it's hard to put a 21st century lens on history uh, because the truth is racism has been a horrible blight upon human existence, um, no matter which side of the war you were on. Um, so I think it, it's, it's very necessary to understand looking through the lens, meaning their, the perspective of the people who lived during it, while also learning the lessons of those who survived it and making it applicable to current world life and how we should treat other people and remind ourselves that we should always love thy neighbor and listen and help. Any other questions? Okay. Well, it looks like we're good to go. If you have any other questions, uh, I guess hit up, hit up the uh, comments on Facebook, or you can send, feel free to send me a message through my Facebook page, which is Nancy E. Shepard, two Ps, A-R-D, author, um, or send me an email. <laughs> there you go. Get to her that way. Looks like we do have a question. Great. Question is, has there been any archaeological work done at the two plantation sites you highlighted? There has been, um, in terms of Adam Boykins, there really isn't much out there. Um, however, there's been a wonderful group of people who have been trying to highlight Nat Turner's legacy, including some of his des descendants, um, and taking you on the path that his insurgency went through. Um, it was just a small farm um, house, so there really hasn't been much there. There's actually a road that runs right through the, um, what was the farm. Um, now up at Rosewell, there has been a ton of archaeology done, still active. They're talking about trying to restructure some of the building itself. Uh, but if you go to the visitor center, which I highly encourage it, uh, it's fascinating. They have some of these artifacts on display, whether it's one of the original lead tiles from the roof, um, pieces of the, the walls and just being surrounded on the property by the bricks, by the archaeology that's continued to be active there. And that's a wonderful thing we have in Virginia is that because we have such a wonderful, rich history, we have a very active archaeology 
seen, I guess you could say, to preserve these things. So thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Well, it looks like there aren't any more uh, questions. So uh, Nancy, thank you very much. Thank it's you. It's always a delight to have you here at the Hampton History Museum. I love being here. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us tonight. I think we're done, but if we're not, uh, thank you again. Remember those things I mentioned when we started, the uh, music event uh, Wednesday night, and uh, come visit us on Saturday uh, when we have our uh, Bayshore uh, event here. So see you then.